Well, welcome everybody. This is Optometry Education Consultants National Webinar Series, Tuesday evening edition. Joe and Greg show. And tonight is Clinical Case Challenge. And I'll tell you where this comes from. This is something that we like to do uh, through our, our e-blasts is when we come across interesting cases or things are a little bit more challenging and maybe not what they appeared to be initially, we like to share them as a clinical case challenge. And we have uh, a plethora of these cases on our website. So you can always go there and, uh, and take a look at that. So we're very, we enjoy doing it every now and then when we have time, we, we, we send an interesting case out. We can always go to the, our website and take a look at them. Well, these are my disclosures. Uh, I'm a consultant or speaker bureau advisory board uh, member for Novartis, Allergan, Glacos, Bausch & Lomb, Airy, Ocular Therapeutics, but I've got no financial interest in any sort of product or things we might talk about tonight. Uh, and I am a co-owner of Optometric Education Consultants with uh, my dear friend Greg here. Greg? Yeah, I think uh, one of the, the couple of big statements in here is the content and activity was prepared independently by Joe and myself. Uh, this wasn't really handed to us and say, hey, please present this. Um, lectured, you can see here, I'm not going to read this whole list, anywhere from Alcon Allergan down to OptiView, advisory boards from Allergan down to Dompe. I do sit as the PA medical director uh, for Involved, uh, and then I sit on their credentialing committee and their uh, special unit investigations. Uh, healthcare registries, uh, I do sit as the chairman of the advisory council for the diabetic diabetes registry. And then a couple other big statements here, I have no direct or financial proprietary interest in any of the company's products or services that I mentioned or Joe mentions tonight. And the content and format of this course presented without any commercial bias. You might hear us mention different companies and so on and so forth. We might point out differences and that's maybe to help you to make a decision, but no commercial bias and no claims of superiority over any commercial product. And as Joe mentioned, half owner, again, with uh, you know, a dear friend, Dr. Salka, there are the live meetings we do enduring and obviously webinars. So Joe, that's my disclosures. Very good. And I'm gonna start off this case and this is kind of where our case challenge began. This was uh, a case that came from an optometrist that Greg knows pretty well. I think her name is Dr. Nikki Rook. And she gave us permission to do this because we, uh, we helped her out a bit. She, you know, she called with a help, Greg, and uh, it was neuro op. And Greg did a did a call to me, and together we kind of worked with her and walked her through on this. And I thought this was really a, a fascinating case, and I, I I sent it out a long time ago. And I think there's a lot of learning to be to be done here. These are going to be all cases because we really believe that some of the best learning comes from friends talking to friends and colleagues talking to the college, hey, I saw an interesting case, let me tell you all about it. Well, she's a 27-year-old woman presenting early complaint of painful vision loss in her right eye. No known medical history, she has an endemic optic nerve with hemorrhaging. Obviously, you can see a swollen nerve, juxtapapillary hemorrhages. A relative accurate pupillary defect on that side, a superior arthritic scotoma on visual fields. Pain as she moves her eye, 2070 visual acuity, and other eyes perfectly normal. Uh, Greg, is there anything I'm missing here? Anything you recall from this case that I should, I should share? No, uh, it's, okay. everything's good. I'd like to just point out that, you know, 27, you know, a lot of times we see 27 year olds coming into the office. And I mean, this patient had a, had a symptom, but, you know, this, this is in 87, this is 27. Okay, so. That brings, and we're going to have a lot of polling questions. But I want people to get involved in this. What is the likely diagnosis? Is it demyelinating optic neuritis, non arteritic anterior ischemic optic neuropathy, arteritic ischemic neuropathy, infectious neuropathy, hereditary neuropathy, infiltrative neuropathy, perineuritis, papilledema, or health? I don't know. That's why I'm here to learn. So you can certainly put, uh, you know, your reply in the in the polling question. You can certainly make comments, thoughts, ask questions in the chat. We'll make this as interactive as we can. So,
So people are thinking about this. 27-year-old woman, 2070 vision, acute aperin defect, swollen nerve, juxtapapillary hemorrhages, pain and eye movement. Yeah, this was a pretty fun case because uh, Joe's my phone, a friend for neuro. Um, and so it was pretty neat. She reached out to me and I said, I know the guy to pull into this text message. So this was fun. It looks like people are thinking and slowing down. So there's a lot here. We're going to go over each and every one of them. So why don't you want to end the uh, end the polling? Yeah, and it looks like uh, demyelinating optic neuritis is winning the race here at 30%. I won't read everything down through there and everything. This kind of seems to be uh, kind of 15 to 20%. A couple people aren't buying into the hereditary optic neuropathy there, Joe. So, okay. And a few people saying, help, I need help. That's why I'm here. Well, let's talk about these age, pain and eye movement, unilateral optic neuropathy. I think first and foremost, what we're always going to think about is demyelinating optic neuritis, usually as a harbinger of uh, undiagnosed multiple sclerosis. And that probably is the most logical thing here, but we have to look a little bit deeper. And I'll share with you a few, uh, a few things to consider. One, remember, demyelinating optic neuritis, and Greg, please, whatever you, you feel the, uh, you, you feel an opening, you want to say something, go right ahead. Okay. Demyelinating optic, neuro neuropathy, demyelinating optic neuritis, two-thirds of the time is retro bulbar. When you say two-thirds of the time, I'm going to tell you probably even more than that, depending on what, uh, what, what study you look at. So this is a bulbar neuropathy. There, there's, there's, a, you know, there's a swollen optic nerve so that sort of is mitigating a little bit away from demyelinating disease or, or optic neuritis proper. Now, also what mitigates, and this is a very important consideration, uh, you, if, if you don't have this, this is a clinical pearl. These hemorrhages are also not really consistent with optic neuritis. You really do not get hemorrhaging in optic, in optic neuritis from MS. So whenever you make a diagnosis of demyelinating optic neuritis, or you're thinking about it, or you're working with somebody to co-manage a patient and they develop disc hemorrhages, we have to strongly think that it's something else. Now, non-arteritic anterior ischemic optic neuropathy, okay, 27, are you sure 27? Yeah, 27 is a bit on the young side. I don't know about you, Greg, the earliest I've ever come across was late 30s. How about yourself? Yeah, I, I would agree. Young, I'm not sure if I had a, a non-arteritic that young, but certainly 40s, that fifth decade. Yeah, 40s and 50s, that, that's a lot more common. These are people who have a disc at risk. And I, I didn't share with you anything about disc at risk here. Uh, it does look like a small optic nerve. It's not outside the realm of possibility, but it's a very unlikely. But again, here's the, here's the key finding. Hey, Non-arteritic anterior ischemic optic neuropathy is a painful, is a painless disease. There's no pain there. So the fact that this is painful mitigates against that diagnosis. Now, arteritic anterior ischemic optic neuropathy, could it look like this? It, it certainly could, but the profile is not right. We don't, you know, we don't really think about it much before age 60. Now, what is the lower limit? You know, once, once 50, it's 50 and above, temporal arteritis, giant cell arteritis is always on the menu. But anything below that, it, if you diagnose arteritic anterior ischemic optic neuropathy in a person in their 20s or 30s, you're going to become famous. You can write that up. You know, that, that would be a first. But unfortunately, you might become famous for the wrong reason because that would be likely a case where the patient went bilaterally blind and we figured it out much too late. But that's, and that's why I call getting Dick Rowe famous. And Greg, to remind me later at the end of the, uh, at the end of the talk, I'll explain to you what Dick Rowe famous uh, means, but we'll do that later if, if we have time. Okay. So the age is not very good. Infectious optic neuropathy, we have to consider, you know, at that, you know, in her age, there are a number of things that could be happening and we can consider, you know, sexually transmitted diseases, 
um, vector uh, vectors such as fleas, ticks. Uh, there are a number of other conditions that could be causing this. So we're going to put that on this. You know, we're going to keep that one on the menu. We can't you know, infectious optic neuropathy. Depending on how much inflammation is is gendered by infection, you can certainly have uh, pain. Now, nobody picked hereditary optic neuropathy, probably for a good reason, because these are patients who are typically male. It is a painless loss of vision. It is going to be relatively rapidly followed, unfortunately, by the fellow eye, the central scotomas, and typically these are people, male, who comes talking specifically, levers hereditary optic neuropathy. Infiltrative optic neuropathy, cancers, sarcoidosis, uh, the uh, connective tissue disease disorders, that is also still on the menu as far as I'm concerned. Now, perineuritis, and here's one to remember, perineuritis is typically a unilateral swollen optic nerve. Uh, it may be painful or painless. It is tend to be unilateral, but the vision is good. And how do we diagnose that? We actually look with MRI, look for enhancement and enlargement of the meningeal sheath surrounding the optic nerve. And when we see that, that is almost always an infectious condition, and the infection is almost always syphilis. Papilledema, okay, well, that is typically a bilateral situation without any vision loss. In my entire career, I've seen exactly one case of true papilledema that was unilateral and there was a brain tumor involved. So that is sort of my, my clip note rundown on these, on these options that we always have to think about with optic neuritis, optic neuropathies. Greg, is there anything you want to add in here? Oh, you covered that well. So there are some possibilities. Demonine is still uh, a very much a long shot, I think, based upon the disc and the hemorrhagic appearance. Infectious and infiltrative really still are on the menu. We have to, we have to consider that. We have to look for a number of things. And we don't go it alone. You know, we work with other medical professionals to help identify what's going on as long as we can share with other medical professionals what I just shared with you as to why it is or isn't something. So I really have to uh, take a look. And one thing we got to consider is neuroretinitis. Now, neuroretinitis, we usually think of that macular star. That, that macular star of exudate is really pretty late. That takes about two weeks to show up. But what does show up is a macular detachment. So whenever you see a patient that looks like this, with a unilateral swollen optic nerve, get out your OCT. And you're not looking for a mucky or a damage, you're looking for a serous detachment. When you see that, you're looking at neuroretinitis, and that is infectious, and many times that is cat scratch disease. So in a safe situation like this, what is the minimum that needs to be done? Well, they need a contrast-enhanced MRI of the orbits and chiasm, high field unit, and fat suppression. The reason is you want to look at the optic nerve and the optic nerve is going to glow white. Uh, anything that happens to the optic nerve is going to glow white. Fat is white. You're looking for a snowball in the snowstorm if you don't tell them to suppress the fat in the orbit so you can actually see the optic nerve. You need a contrast-enhanced brain MRI looking for a curve and trick of white matter lesions or any other mass lesions or possible signs of infection. And they have to be tested for other infectious agents, Bartonella, uh, syphilis, Lyme, tuberculosis, uh, herpes, Epstein-Barr, uh, and, and there are a number of things. These are best done in concert with a primary care physician or if you really think that it is infectious, and infectious to these specialists. I am not, with the, ex with the exception of the neuroimaging, I am not ordering the blood test myself. I'm working with somebody else to do that. Now, on this one, the MRI came back, and there's optic nerve enhancement, possibly consistent with infectious autoimmune or granulomas disease. There's no evidence of demyelinization of the optic nerve or the brain. 
Basically, it doesn't help much. Other than it says the after, there's nothing wrong with the aftercare, but you do. All right, so it, it tells you we don't have demyelinating disease, but it could be any of the other things we just talked about. Uh, serologic testing on this patient, very high titus, Epstein bar virus. And that's what the patient had. The patient had infectious optic neuropathy. You know, the optic neuropathies can directly involve the optic nerve by the pathogen or indirectly involved through inflammation, degenerative or vascular mechanisms. And when inflammation is involved, that's where pain and eye comes from. When there's not significant involvement of the inflammation, there's more direct infection of the optic nerve. That's why it tends to be painless. Greg, anything you want to add here? I think one of the biggest things I'll add is that you mentioned kind of picking up the phone, calling, talking, PCP, maybe the MRI um, unit, uh, just to, you know, so don't just, I got a swollen optic nerve here, um, you know, kind of bring into the age, remind remind the docs, you know, probably not, you know, giant cell arteritis, a little too young, you know, ischemic optic neuropathy, eh, probably not, help guide them. Um, you know, we, we sit back and I think, you know, laugh like, ha, 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 they put this patient on sulfacetamide or gentamicin. Why aren't they picking a better antibiotic for a conjunctivitis? Or, oh, they're using uh, an antibiotic to treat an iritis. Um, you know, so again, we know that the, that, you know, I always say, look, I'm not throwing them under the bus. Don't come see me if you have a gunshot wound or a heart attack, right? You know, if you have an eye problem, come to the eye doc. But when it's time, when these start getting involved, pick up the phone. Uh, they'll thank you for it. And then all of a sudden you'll start getting referrals too, because they know you're a, a team player. And, and don't send to the ER blind because the, the ER physician, they will do it a non-contrast and CT of the head. The reason is because they're looking for, for intracranial bleed. That, that's what they do. And after that, they're, they're kind of lost. In my practice, uh, I get, uh, I get when, when I'm called, I get calls from Sarasota Memorial Hospital and Venice Regional Hospital ER. Hey, can I run a case by you? We got, I've got a question about this. And, you know, save me from getting that late night call. You know, send things over with them that, that helps them to, uh, to work out the patient. Now, in, there are so many things that can cause an infectious optic neuropathy. Syphilis is a, is a common one. It can be retro bulbar, it can be bulbar, it can be a neuroretinitis, it can be a perineuritis. Now, can I look at it and say, yeah, this is syphilitic? No, I can look at this and say, well, we need to do a uh, testing for syphilis. The testing will tell me if, it, if that's what it is. Now, retro bulbar and bulbar syphilitic neuropathy, these are pretty severe vision reduction, but as I said perineuritis, it's a swollen nerve, but the, uh, the vision is really pretty good. If you got a good vision and a swollen nerve, you got to consider that. The MRI is going to show you optic nerve sheath enhancement. That's the phase of perineuritis. Now you know to tell them to look for syphilis. And Lyme is very similar to uh, syphilis. Uh, it, it mimics it uh, quite uh, quite well. I think syphilis does, Lyme can do. Just that uh, you know, Lyme Lyme disease. Uh, is you know syphilis is a sexually transmitted disease and Lyme disease is not unless the patient's like really unusual. Toxoplasmosis, HIV, cytomegalovirus, that's a very destructive condition. Now neuroretinitis, and that is a form of infectious optic neuropathy. That's usually a benign cat scratch disease where actually fleas are the doctors, not so much that. And the neuroretinitis, there's a mild after defect compared to the severity of the vision loss. Now, this woman, this woman had a brown RAPD and only had moderate vision loss. So that kind of points away from neuroretinitis. But the severity of the vision loss is disproportionate to the after defect. That's why it is probably more retinitis than it is neuro. But these people will have a serous retinal detachment. You know, from the disc to the macula. And that, because that, those exudates only come with, and that's what you're looking for in neuroretinitis. Get out your OCT. Here's a patient I saw at the university, quote unquote, strep throat. You should count fingers uh, on antibiotics for a day, a mild after a defect, or a vision, swollen nerve, no exudates, but you can see that sear, not, not edema. You can actually see that serous detachment from the mac from the disc to the macula. 
And that tells you it's not strep throat, it is probably neuroarthritis, it's the bite of something wild, it's, uh, it's Bartonella, Lyme, it's something, it's, it's infectious. So neuroretinitis and infectious neuropathies have a lot of etiologies, toxoparietis, plasmosis, Lyme, simplex, zoster, Epstein-Barr virus, malignant hypertension, <clears throat> can, can show as a neuroretinitis, ischemic neuropathies can look like a neuroretinitis, Bartonella, very common. Now, if it's Bartonella, Quintana or a Hensley, and this is a cat scratch, Paranox ocular glandular syndrome. The prognosis is very good. You don't really need to treat those. Those patients will get better on their own. But you feel you feel you need to do something. Doxycycline, 100 milligrams uh, by a mile twice a day for about a month will probably speed resolution. Uh, the mucky macula does not need a Vastin or Lucentis or Ilea. But I'm talking about this prognosis here if they have a benign Bartonella infection and true neuroretinitis. If we go up here and any of these other things, oh, they have to be treated. You know, treating, treating the underlying disease is gonna treat the neuropathy. So these are patients, you know, they, we need to identify this potentially infectious, what is the agent, treat the infectious agent, that is in conjunction with other physicians, and that's what's going to do the best for the patient. Greg, if you want to add on that one, because I, I thought that was, I, I enjoyed talking about that and working with Nikki on that one. No, I, I, so the two comments that I would make is just knowing the area of kind of Western, Northern, Central Pennsylvania up there, I, I would have you know, probably bet about $20 that would have been Lyme disease. And so it was kind of neat to see that it wasn't. And then the only other comment that I would have is you talked about doxycycline and we use doxycycline a lot as optometrists, kind of that 50 milligrams once or twice a day, kind of is that uh, inflammatory side to doxycycline treating like that rosacea nose, meibomian gland dysfunctions. In that case there, you said hundred milligrams twice a day, that's the infectious side. So it's kind of like aspirin. If you give it aspirin at 81 milligrams, you get antiplatelet, you really don't get any, any analgesic or any anti-inflammatory. You have to give them at higher doses. Doxy at a low dose is anti-inflammatory at a high dose is the anti-infective. And that's that hundred milligrams twice a day. So. And Greg, I just clipped this one in because this came in on a consult uh, for me last week uh, with one of our local referring uh, ODs. And it had a lot of similarities to the last one. So I wanted to, uh, you know, kind of sneak this one almost like as a case 1B. This is a 20, and I'm going to give you all the detail that I have, or the only detail I have. It's a 22 year old female who went to the optometrist for her first eye exam because she had blurred vision at 2040 and 2070. And I don't know truly if that was uncorrected or best corrected. Uh, I'm not sure. In fact, uh, in this practice, they do photographs or, or these images first. And as the optometrist soon as he saw it, you know, got in, the, got in, started texting me as to what to do. I got no medical history for you, other than that she is reportedly got a thin build. So Greg, what, what do y'all see in there? They're, they're, they're okay photos. Tell me what you think, what you're saying. Yeah, um, and you know, the first thing is I see a multiple cotton wool spots. So. Anytime you see, even if you see one, I do the same type of technology in the practice. We have five ODs and sometimes you don't see it as obvious as this. And there's multiple cotton wool spots there. And in my clinical parlor would be any cotton wool. Now this obviously needs worked up. No one's going to say, oh, this doesn't need worked up. But we find hemorrhages with this instrument all the time, little dot hemorrhages. We don't walk, work every single little hemorrhage up, but we do work every single cotton wool spot. But there's a ton of cotton wool spots there. There's some hemorrhaging. And in that right macula, you do see kind of that exudate of, which is going to tell me that this just didn't happen, you know, two days ago. So that's what I would point out. You see hemorrhaging, cotton wool spots, and exudate. And, you know, obviously there's some edema in there. Those would be the, uh, yeah, and then the, 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 the nerve head uh, changes that are going on. All right, that brings me to polling question number two. What's the likely diagnosis and plan? Is that bilateral CRVO and coagulopathy workup? Is it idiopathic intracranial hypertension? You should prescribe diamox and weight loss. 
Is it a brain tumor? Get an immediate MRI. Is malignant hypertension? Get blood pressure and send to the ER. Is infectious optic neuropathy? Because that's what the last case was. And that's what I'm thinking about. Or health? I don't know. That's why I'm here. So people are looking at this. I'm going to actually go back one so you can see the uh, photographs. 22 years old, slight build, no, no medical history. First eye exam, some blurred vision. It looks like this. Okay. What do you think, Greg? I'll pull the plug on this poll. The people have slowed down quite a bit. So we got about 62%. So just so everyone knows, we need to make these live and interactive. So if we can get that polling reply up a little bit higher for you guys that are out there, that would be great. That's part of the, re the requirements to be interactive. So we have chat box to do that too, but we also have the polling question. So Joe looks like uh, malignant hypertension is winning the race there. All right, very good. Well, let's let let's let's consider everything here. All right, bilateral CRVO need to coagulopathy workup. In uh, if I said a 22 year old had a bilateral C CRVO, the answer is you do a coagulopathy workup. It's not like this can be faster disease. Now we have involvement ret retinopathy in all four quadrants. Yes, we have disc edema, but the veins are not dilated and tortuous. Maybe the veins are a little, little dilated, but they're definitely not tortuous. That kind of puts me away from that. Idiopathic intracranial hypertension can certainly fall into a, uh, an appearance like this, but we don't just prescribe diamox and weight loss. We have to do the entire evaluation including MRI, MRV, possibly a, a lumbar puncture. They have to make sure that uh, there's nothing else going on. Brain tumor, immediate, immediate MRI. Well, we have, we have, in my opinion, looking at this, Greg, and, and if you agree or disagree, please, please join in if you want to say anything. It isn't so much the disc edema that oppresses me as much as the retinopathy. So I'm sort of questioning that. Malignant hypertension, get a blood pressure, and if, if elevated, send to the ER. Now this is only a 22-year-old thin young woman, but Greg, look at look at all that cotton wool spot. You know, look at all this all the cotton wool spotting, the the macular star. To me, this is an ischemic fungus. That's one of the things that was most impressive to me when I was was communicating with the, the OD who, who wants uh, who some advice on this. Well, let's go back and, and see what happens. My recommendation is first thing to do is, you know, get a, get a blood pressure reading. Blood pressure came back as 180, 180 over 144. And he confessed to me, he said, my blood pressure skills are not as good as they used to be when I was in school, so it could actually even be higher. So the diagnosis potentially is malignant hypertension. The most likely diagnosis here is malignant hypertension. And we look at this and we have all the, all the ischemia there, the cotton wool spots, the mild disc edema, the, the macular star, that, that's really pointing for it, but it could be other things. This is a person that needs intracranial studies. They do need an MRI and, and an MRV because it's not, you know, not to say people who have massively elevated blood pressure can't have brain tumors as well. But the most likely issue here is the patient does have malignant hypertension out of a 22 year old. Any thoughts there that, would, that could be causing that growth? Um, nothing in my mind right now. The only thing that comes to my mind is possibly an adrenal tumor. But it's not our, it's not our job to diagnose adrenal tumors. It's not our job to diagnose why the patient's malignant hypertension. It's our job to tell the ER physician what she or he should be doing and what our thoughts are. And they're going to pull up this and 
They're going to be doing cerebral spinal fluid analyses and they're going to be doing intracranial analyses, but sending them in the right direction with the right information is what's going to be very helpful. And when I looked at these photographs without any, any history at all, what struck me is the ischemia in, this, in these eyes. And regardless of the patient profile, it will look at hypertension for proven otherwise. Greg, do you have any thoughts on, on hypertension emergencies and urgencies? What's the difference there? But I'm going to let you cover that in a second here because I really want to just talk about those. One of the, you know, the you, I'm going to hammer and echo what I said earlier. When I looked at that fundus, the first thing I saw was you know the cotton wool spots, and I pointed out the cotton wool spots. And the the key here is that that's ischemia. You know, don't blow off. You know, these are pretty obvious that like you're not going to blow this off. But I have cases where I found one cotton wool spot had them worked up and it could be some type of blood dyscrasia. Um, you know, it, it, patient just needs to be worked up. Cotton wool spots is ischemia. Joe, you've mentioned it multiple times, ischemia. This is a very ischemic retina. Um, you know, that can kind of help you with, with what's going on with your diagnosis and then working with the other physicians. Absolutely. Now, hypertensive emergencies and urgencies. Uh, an emergency is severe hypertension and end organ damage. Now, what is end organ damage? Encephalopathy, intracranial hemorrhage, myocardial infarction, ventricular failure, pulmonary edema, dissecting aneurysm, eclampsia, or the eye, retinopathy. Now, a blood pressure that has some um, arterial sclerosis associated with it, and a couple of cotton wool spots, I don't know is going to go to the emergency room. But when we have something as involved as what we saw here with disc edema, this is end state, this is end organ damage. These are people who require immediate blood pressure reduction. I mean, not the normal ranges, but we have to prevent organ damage. And these are people who are gonna be admitted through the ER for aggressive parenteral treatment. Now, urgencies are severe hypertension, but no end organ damage. This is the person who has not, not used their medicine for a while. These are gonna be identified during routine examination. This is non adherence or inadequate treatment you know, by the PCP. This is a phone call or referral back to their PCP you know, within a couple of days, certainly, and get them back on track. But there's no end organ damage. The only end organ damage that we're really good at seeing is in the eye. And yes, we have to look. You know, look. Because the ER physicians aren't going to look. They need to know what's going on there. And urgency doesn't require aggressive reduction of blood pressure. Okay? That can be associated with uh, morbidity. So what we need to do is they, they need to be brought it down in a slow and controlled uh, fashion. They're going to be treated with oral medicines, titrated up over several days to, uh, to evaluate the response to therapy, such as a person who's got a very elevated intraocular pressure from undiagnosed glaucoma. But with end organ damage, they, they certainly need to go to the ER now. One thing I get asked a lot is, what about diabetes patients? Well, if you can, you, you, we need to look in the eye. We need to do it with the fundus camera, with our imaging system, with undiet, you know, undiet. You're not going to hurt a patient by using 2.5% 2, 2 phenylephrine. Even in malignant hypertension, it's not going to cause any in towards damage. So if you've done that, you've dilated the patient, and you use phenylephrine, you're not, there's no evidence that's ever hurt a patient. Like 10% neosinephrine has been associated with some problems. But what we use diagnostically, you know, for this turns out to be malignant hypertension, you've not done anything wrong. Greg, anything there? You know, I'm just gonna just just say that, you know, we don't see a lot of, you know, changes to the retina because the retinal blood vessels, don't forget, can auto-regulate. And the blood pressure has been up so high and so long that it's now kind of overcoming the auto-regulating part. So that's why, you know, you might get someone that their blood pressure goes up and that's a beautiful part about the eye. The eye and the blood vessels can auto-regulate, but you can see that that mechanism has been taken over here uh, by this condition. So that's my only comment. 
Now, this is a 33-year-old female who mentions headache and horizontal diplopia. And I will tell you, she has a mild six-nerve paresis uh, that was picked up. Headache, she, uh, she has transient visual obscurations about 20 times per day. She's not blacking out by any means, but it tends to gray out or, 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 or fade out for a few seconds. She's not using oral contraceptives. She's not using tetracycline. She has no vitamin A usage. She reports that she lost about 10 pounds and that was commensurate with her headaches getting better. Her blood pressure is 118 over 72. She's five foot five, 160 pounds. That puts us uh, at a body mass index of about 26 to 27. And she so, Joe, why are you going for the vitamin A? I mean, I get tetracyclines and the oral contraceptives. Um, why, you know, why did you specifically, as a neuro guy, ask for vitamin A? Because things that have been associated with increased intracranial pressure have been the, the oral contraceptives causing uh, a prothrombotic state and venous sinus thrombosis, uh, as, are, or, or, as vitamin A as well state. Thank you. And this is where we see we have a bilateral disc edema. It is not hemorrhagic. She has a bit of a large blind spot in each eye. She has a little bit of an arthritic defect or superior hemifield defect in the right eye, very mild. Vision still good. You can see this, this very thick pattern of, of, of juxtapathory nerve fiber layer, or what I call the Patriot sign, which is indicating a lot of juxtapathory uh, nerve fiber layer thickness or edema. And that can to polling question number three, what is the most likely diagnosis? Is it pseudotumor cerebri? Is it idiopathic intracranial hypertension? Is it malignant hypertension? Is it an intracranial mass lesion or help? I don't know. That's why I'm here. So Joe, you mentioned that, you know, you didn't see any, and, and I'm going to keep hammering this because I think they're important. Um, you, you said it wasn't hemorrhagic, but I also didn't see any cotton wool spots. So. Indeed. Which we, 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 when in the absence of cotton wool spots and certainly the absence of hemorrhage tells us this is sort of a chronic situation. It's not acute. Okay, we're cruising through. We'll give a few more seconds. And thanks everyone for you know replying to this. Again, it does help with keeping us in compliant, making sure that these are interactive. I think we're good there, Joe. I think so. So we have number one pseudotumor. Number two is IIH. We have a, we have a, a question of malignant hypertension or intracranial mass lesion. And the answer is, well, kind of yes. So let's talk about this. And one thing I want to point out, she did, her blood pressure really wasn't that elevated in this case. Pseudotumor and IIH, okay? Very much or very close to the same thing. Now, could this be a mass lesion? The answer is absolutely true. It absolutely can be. We don't diagnose pseudotumor unless we've done the requisite testing. And the requisite testing would, would be an MRI and an MRV and possibly a lumbar function. But we can never, you know, pseudotumor, IIH, they are really diagnosing exclusion. And I'm going to ferret out these or tease out what these really, these conditions really are. We always have to consider the possibility of mass lesion because IIH and pseudotumor become diagnosis of exclusion. So let's talk about this. And you can see that the people who said pseudotumor or IIH are, it's really the same. Pseudotumor is increased intracranial pressure, but there's no mass lesion. There's no increased brain volume. All it means is, is increased intracranial pressure, but there's no tumor. 
but many causative agents have been identified. Tetracyclines, vitamin A, oral contraceptives. Oral contraceptives create a full thrombotic state and a venous sinus thrombosis. Venous sinus thrombosis can cause pseudotum. That's why we have to get an MRI and an MRV, uh, magnetic venous, uh, mag magnetic resonance venography. We have to have both of those. Those are two mandatory tests for suspected papillodema. Now, IIH, people think this is the more current term, the more correct term. It really isn't. This is increased intracranial pressure, but there's no identifiable cause. These are usually younger females, childbearing age, sometimes uh, are slightly overweight. They're the ones who are at risk. If there is a cause, a drug, uh, a prothrombotic state, we call it pseudotum. In the absence of all of that, we can call it IIH. IIH is pseudotum. It is specifically primary pseudotum. In the minocycline, tetracycline, oral contraceptive use, venous sinus thrombosis, we call it secondary pseudotum, or secondary to something else. So IIH and pseudotum, pseudotum is still a good term. It is the best term. It could imply, all it implies is increased intracranial pressure, no, no two. Could be caused by venous sinus thrombosis, secondary. Could be caused by nothing. Primary IIH. Greg, any thoughts here? No, oh, you covered that well. So diagnosing pseudotum, we have to have signs or symptoms consistent with increased intracranial pressure, typically headache, uh, horizontal double vision, tinnitus, transit visual obscurations, these are all uh, vomiting, uh, vomiting while nausea, projectile vomiting. These are all things associated with increased intracranial pressure and papilledema. Now, it could be subtle. Very carefully, you know, understand. It could be very, very subtle discipline. And the neurologic examination has to be normal. The only thing they can have besides disc edema is a six nerve palsy. With a unilateral bilateral, that is allowed. The neuroimaging has to be normal. No hydrocephalus, no mass, no blood, no structural lesion, no venous sinus thrombosis. And the cerebral spinal fluid pressure has to be normal and elevated if a lumbar puncture is done. So these are all consistent with pseudotum. We, we can't make this diagnosis without doing these tests. Now, more and more, we're getting away from lumbar puncture. Lumbar puncture is being deferred a lot. And if you're ever in a situation where you think that maybe somebody's not doing the job properly because they didn't report an, an, an LP, the reason is imaging's got very sophisticated. Now, MRI can show actually a flattening of the posterior lung. And it can show an empty cell of tercica. Now, the pituitary gland sits in the, in the cell of tercica. And it's this gelatinous type of gland that gets squashed down so by increased intracranial pressure. So it looks as though there's nothing in the cell of tercica. So globe flattening, an empty cella, or apparently empty cella. The MRV shows no thrombosis, so the transverse venous sinus is not blocked. There's no evidence of fever or infection. And they have a typical profile, younger female, somewhat overweight. And a lot of times, lumbar puncture won't be done. But if all these criteria are met and it's pretty clean, they will obviate during the, uh, the lumbar puncture. So if you think that it must be done, I will tell you, it is not always done and it is not substantial. Greg, anything you want to uh, throw in before we go on to your case here? Uh, no, that was good. Why don't you take this one over then, Greg? Tell me when to advance. Okay. Um, this is you know, obviously case four. This is a 16 year old man or child, and uh, vision has been fluctuating for about uh, six weeks. The primary kit. Uh, primary care doc feels that it's just normal growth spurt. Mom feels it's migraines as there is a strong family history, but mom in her intuition says that she still wants to get uh, the eyes checked. 
Vision is 2020, uh, right and left, uncorrected. Externals are normal. And meds are inhaler for asthma and taking minocycline uh, 50 milligrams twice a day for acne. So here are the optic nerve heads of this child. And I think what you can see here is again, keeping with the theme, we got these swollen uh, optic nerve heads uh, in both eyes. So not sure if there was anything beyond that, Joe, if you wanna click on. So, you know, it's not rare uh, if it's in your chair. So Joe, I usually kind of punt to you um, on this part whenever we have this discussion is, you know, we have a child here that's 16, maybe taking a medication that's causing this. It's five o'clock on a Friday. We have a bilateral swollen nerve head. You know, you can go back to the meds and what we're talking about here is we're talking about, you know, minocycline. You know, it, it does have a, a side effect of swollen nerve heads. Maybe that's what it is. Um, you feel pretty strongly, you know, does this patient, you know, Friday night versus Monday morning need to be worked up? Yeah, the answer is absolutely yes. All right, we, we, we have a potential cause. But the important thing is to ask, not what do we think it is, but always ask what else could it be? And in the case like this, this can be an intracranial bleed, though the patient may, you know, would, would probably have some somnolence or, or, or affect disorder, but it could be a brain tumor. So this is something that is, you know, it's not subtle, it, you know, it's very obvious. It's not a bilateral uh, central retinal vein occlusion. It's bilateral disc edema. In a person who is otherwise asymptomatic, that could be increased intracranial pressure, this is a person that actually needs to be sent to the ER, but we need to tell them what to do. You know, this is not a person needs a, a non-contrast enhanced uh, CT of the brain. They need a contrast enhanced uh, MRI. You know, looking, you know, looking for in mass lesion, uh, structural abnormalities. They need an MRD because this can happen, you know, certainly in in younger males. This is not overweight females. So they absolutely need an MRI. MRI. They probably need some, some blood studies to make sure there's no infectious cause. And they will probably actually get a lumbar puncture to make sure there's no meningitis. But this is a person that absolutely needs to be uh, evaluated immediately. And that's best done in the ER with your direction and your assistance. So bilateral swollen optic nerve heads will launch the pole. We see a suspicious medication there. What is your most likely diagnosis? Is it pseudotumor? Is it IIH? Is it malignant hypertension? Is it a mass lesion or help? I don't know. It's why I'm here. I think we're getting a lot, we're getting a little bit more of an engagement on this one. Which is great, yeah. Okay. All right, so. Greg, I think we, we can call it here. So, so looks like pseudotumor, pseudotumor is winning. I'll let you go through them, Joe. Go ahead. Well, Malina Hypertense, I, I didn't give you the uh, I didn't give you the blood pressure, we didn't give you the blood pressure on this one. Uh, so it's hard to say that for sure. Mass lesion, it can always be mass lesion. We always have to consider that. But if, if our imaging is unremarkable and there is no venous sinus thrombosis, there's no acute infection, intracranial infection, comes down to is it IIH or pseudotumor? And probably the most uh, encompassing diagnosis would fall under pseudotumor. IIH would be if we have no potential cause, and here we have a potential cause, and that is a minocycline. So, Greg, why don't you uh, why don't you take it away and tell us about that? So that was the most likely diagnosis that, <laughs> or after ruling out the and getting the proper imaging. Um, this case did come in on a late evening, and that's why I brought that up. And, you know, the mom, in a sense, tried talking uh, uh, me out of, you know, 
working this patient up. And uh, as you can see, and I'm not sure, Joe, can you click back a slide or are these all the, are these all the uh, images that you have? Okay, go ahead and go forward. Um, you can see here that uh, you see some pretty swollen nerve heads uh, down towards the bottom. And then at the middle here, you can see that uh, the, 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 in about 43 days after discontinuing the minocycline, that the optic nerve head edema uh, did go away. So I guess whenever you find the, think that it's the minocycline, you have a bi bilateral swollen optic nerve head and you say, well, we think it's the minocycline. You know, by definition, Joan, you can correct me if I'm wrong, we could say that this still is idiopathic intracranial hypertension with the suspicion that this could be a secondary uh, uh, pseudotumor cerebri from minocycline. You discontinue the minocycline, you can drop now the idiopathic part because we do have a cause, but it's not your patient that's overweight in a sense that would be your true, you know, maybe pseudotumor cerebri patient that we talk about. This would be your, your, your secondary pseudotumor cerebri. Would that be a good way to classify that, Joe? I think it'd be an excellent way. Okay. So, yeah, it's just these terms that are out there, and Joe and I hear it all the time. Oh, well, you know, you, you always have to call it intracranial idiopathic. Well, not this one. We do have a secondary a second. reason. So it's a secondary to the, uh, to the minocycline pseudotumor cerebri. So I want to talk about some side effects. Just go ahead and animate that slide, Joe. Is, you know, you got to be careful with the uh, oral tetracycline analogs. The oral tetracycline analogs would be minocycline and doxycycline. Those are your two big ones that are out there. R very rarely do we use tetracycline. It's usually doxy or minnow. And this here cartoon reminds me, you know, that it does and, you know, create some enhanced photosensitivity. It also reminds me that this is an oral medication and you got to avoid it in children and in and pregnancy, it was a category D back in the older uh, type of nomenclature from the FDA pregnancy. If you remember A, B, C, D, and X, that has changed, but it still would be category D. And, uh, and it would also now have a hybrid to it, to the new classification. So we would avoid this in children and, and in pregnancy. It can enhance Coumadin, it can enhance digoxin. Now, I throw this in here not for the reason to avoid. I make tons of phone calls all day long. If, if I had a patient that was coming in and I wanted to use doxycycline for maybe my Bohmian gland dysfunction, and I see they're on Coumadin, I don't go, ooh, it's contraindicated. If I feel that this patient is going to be their best therapy to resolve their my Bohmian gland dysfunction, or you know, if they're on digoxin, it's a call to the primary care doc. It's a call to the cardiologist to say, hey, I'd like to use this you know, minocycline 50 milligrams once a day, maybe pill cutter cutting it in half, you know, 25 milligrams in the morning, 25 milligrams in the evening. And I know that this can enhance Coumadin or digoxin. You know, the cardiologist might go, oh, it's just a, you know, it's an antibiotic. You're going to be using it for a short period of time. Their dig levels will be okay. And you say, no, 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 no. That's why I'm picking up the phone here and calling you is this is more like a dermatological condition, you know, my Bohmian gland dysfunction, or, you know, maybe some ocular rosacea or whatever you're using it for. And that's why I'm calling you to, to be a, you know, a good teammate here to let you know that they're going to probably be on it for maybe six to 12 months. Oh, okay. Thanks for calling. We'll get their dig, dig uh, levels checked and adjust them accordingly. Um, and the same thing with Coumadin, just, you know, get their, you know, their, their, their clotting times checked, uh, you know, and just make sure the in internist or primary care doctor is well aware. Now, maybe that doesn't require such a, a phone call, but, you know, I do like those phone calls uh, so that I can say, at least I chatted with, you know, the, the uh, PA uh, physician assistant or the, the doc themselves um, to, to just, you know, it just makes me feel better, especially on the Coumadin. You know, I don't want them, the patients get confused sometimes anyway, because, you know, you get a phone call, take two, take one, take two. And the patient's just like, you know what? I'm just taking two all the time, whatever. So sometimes their plotting, plotting times could be a little bit off. You know, there was, I get this question every so often from the podium. Hey, did you ever read that about breast cancer and the increased risk of long-term? It really wasn't a great, uh, uh, study, it was kind of pulled apart and so on and so forth. And it was discredited. 
But you can see here, you know, the, the benign intracranial hypertension, the pseudotumor cerebri, you know, it's only about 17 cases were reported between uh, uh, 1978 and 2002. And that's because, you know, this case here uh, that, that I just showed you, um, I didn't report it. Uh, you know, it was a side effect of, you know, minocycline or doxycycline. So, you know, just be aware. I think everyone is kind of aware of it. I'm in a practice of five ODs, five optometrists. And, you know, I'm usually there about three to four days a week. Um, my wife is there part-time. Um, one guy's retiring. So I'm going to say we probably have an equivalent of, say, three and a half to four. And we get a patient that does come in a quarterly with this, you know, side effect of minocycline, doxycycline. So my clinical pearl is, you know, review all this stuff, swollen nerve heads, you know, make sure, you know, that these patients that are coming in that you do see that are on it, um, that you're reminding them that they can get a swollen nerve and at least get their eyes checked every year or if they get any kind of the scintillating scotomas or any, you know, neurological, you know, signs or symptoms to make, make sure they make a call so we can make sure that they're not having this um, kind of secondary pseudotumor. Can you get to the next slide, Joe? So with that being said, you know, I always like to, you know, review the medications. I lecture with a pharmacist. I've learned a lot in pharmacology from lecturing with Dr. Offerdahl. And uh, um, this patient comes in and, and she says to me, I said to her, you know, hey, Jane, how you doing? The doc doing great. Well, you know, maybe not doing so great, but you know, really no pain or any issues going on here. Um, but no one can really figure out what's going on in my legs here. So I said, well, what do you mean? So she has long pants on. So she decides to, you know, pull her pant leg up and I go, geez, oh man, you know, what's going on there? And then, you know, she turns around and all of a sudden I just go like this. And she turns around and she goes, doc, you know, why are you doing this? And I said to her, I said, Jane, I said, I did this to you. She goes, wait, doc, I've been to a couple of docs and they actually took a little skin biopsy and you know, what do you mean you did this to me? You're my eye doc. You're up here and not down here at my legs. You know, I'm not putting any creams on here. And I said, remember when I put you on that minocycline, you know, 50 milligrams twice a day. And I said, you know, be careful with some pigmentary changes. She goes, yeah, but <laughs> you mean like this? And I said, ding, ding, ding. This is exactly what we're talking about where minocycline or doxycycline can create these hyper pigmentations. So she came in, we were able to stop her medication and um, yeah, I reported back to all the PCPs and you know, a couple of them were banging her head going, geez, I oh mean, you know, we learned about this, we know about it, but just didn't think it was gonna be this, you know, this kind of um, intense type of presentation. So we stopped it, you know, 50 milligrams twice a day. And go ahead, Joe, I think I have some follow-up photos here. And you can see six months later how she started to fade do I have the year follow-ups in there, Joe? And there we go, one year later. So you can see here, um, you know, a lot of times it's, you know, it's it's reversible. She didn't get back 100%, but, you know, I encourage, you know, all my colleagues whenever I present this live or whenever I present this, you know, on a webinar, you know, all you have to do is go to Google type in two words, type in minocycline hyperpigmentation, just those two words. Hit enter, go over and hit images and you'll see all types of images. I've done this to my patients probably three times, people that I was treating with meibomian gland dysfunction. And I don't bring this up again to, to say, oh my gosh, I'm never using minocycline again because I still prescribe minocycline quite a bit. It works well for that meibomian gland. You know, I've had people come in and they said, hey doc, you know, these look at my fingernails. They look like, you know, kind of a little smurf, little purple color. I'm like, yep, that's what we're talking about. Let's get you off of this before, you know, it's reversible, but uh, yeah, it can happen. But the other part is, is that when patients come in and they're taking this medication, they're using it from another physician. I like to warn them because I'll say, hey, do you know it can cause swollen nerve heads? No, I didn't know that. Okay, that's good to know. So, you know, if you have any of those signs or symptoms that we talk about or something just doesn't seem right, just give me a call. Right now, your nerve looks good today. You know, also be aware that this can create some pigmentations anywhere in your body. And there's probably been a few times where people have gone, hey, you mean like this? And I go, like that, right there. 
and called up the primary care doc or whoever prescribed it and let them know. Or I've had a handful of cases where people said, hey, remember how you warned that? That happened to me between last year and this year. And I was able to call my doctor up and uh, they were very appreciative that you reminded me. So just be aware. Um, you remember optometry, we wear many hats and uh, you might see this uh, in your clinic. Um, and then the picture on the left there, that was the original picture. And then the picture on the right there is how she faded in over about a year, so. Greg, a question came in the chat. What was the range of the patient? Does it occur equally across all races? Um, she is a white patient. Um, and we've had this question with Tracy, uh, does it, does it um, occur equally across all races? And the answer is yes, because it's kind of a iron type of deposition but you know, in a in a black patient, it might be a little bit harder to detect, right? It might be more in the fingernails type of situation. So, um, you know, my uh, race uh, where I work is predominantly white. Uh, so those are the cases that I have seen. But I've asked Tracy, is it equally across all races? And I believe her answer was yes. Excellent, uh, uh, excellent discussion there, Greg. As I present the next one, if you want to perhaps uh, throw the the uh, handouts into the chat room, I don't think we've done that yet tonight. Okay. Yep. You're I'll a good reminder. Thank you. I will present the next one. So there's going to be two handouts coming, guys. It's going to be the the full handouts, all the slides. Some people like that since it's PDFs, and you can mark them up. And then uh, there are also going to be six slides per page. So sorry, Joe. Go ahead. No worries. All right. So we have uh, a. A 13-year-old female who has referred me for a painless reduced vision. Down to 2040 in her left eye with an abnormal screening visual field and reportedly an elevated intraocular pressure and an aperitive feedback. Now, her previous exam was three weeks earlier, and she had been previously referred to an ophthalmologist over a year earlier than that by another optometrist, but her mother didn't know why and, uh, and didn't take it. And this is what we see here. Key piece of diagnostic information that I didn't give you was her pressure was 28 and 43. Now, pachymetry, she was slightly thicker uh, than, than normal, but there's no biomicroscopic or gonioscopic abnormalities. Both angles were open. What we can see is a pretty robust nerve in the right eye and a very, very cupped nerve on the, uh, on the left. So with that, what is the most likely diagnosis on point question number five? Is it an orbital tumor in the left eye causing cupping and elevated pressure? Is it primary open angle glaucoma? Is it juvenile glaucoma? Or help, I don't know. Let me launch that polling. That's why I'm here. So what's the most likely diagnosis here? Is normal tumor causing cupping and pressure? Is it open angle glaucoma? Is it juvenile glaucoma? Or, geez, I don't know. That's what I want to learn. Hello? So we got a lot of people pacing in here, Greg. All right. They almost got the clinical challenges in glaucoma handout. That's why it took me a little while, but no worries. I've got the right ones in there. Uh, clinical case challenges, full slide and uh, six slides per page are both in the people, people that you're looking for them. They're in the chat and they should be downloadable. Again, they'll also be, uh, they're in the 645 email, but they'll also be in all the post event emails that you can download. Excellent. All right. All right. Greg, I think we're slowing down a little bit, so let's end our end our polling and uh, we'll share the results. I've got orbital tumor, I've got POAG, I've got juvenile glaucoma, and oh, I don't know this, why I'm here learning. All right, well, let's start talking about this and what we what we're dealing with here. And you know, tumors, you know, is not really going to necessarily cause distinct cupping without power or vision loss. And I, I can see where, you, where one would be concerned. And this is a, a red free. I can tell you there's no pallets with no retinal rim. There is compromise in there. The pressure is markedly elevated. It's also elevated in both eyes. 
And she actually has juvenile open angle glaucoma. Glaucoma does happen to kids. Uh, I, you know, in my glaucoma service at Novi University, when I was there, I've had a, a significant number of true juvenile open angle glaucomas. This is open angle glaucoma is diagnosed typically during childhood. It develops somewhere between age three and early adulthood. Now I've got here a question for 40 years. All right, if we look at the literature, juvenile open angle glaucoma is reported up to age 40, 45 years. And to me that, I, I, find a, I find it hard to call that juvenile now. If you give me a person who's 35 years old, who's got a 28 pressure, a uh, little bit of a notch and uh, a nasal defect in one eye, that's primary open angle glaucoma. But you give me somebody who's 30 years old with a pressure of 40 and 95% cupped nerves, that, you know, that happened years ago. This is more aggressive uh, than primary open angle glaucoma. But in contrast to what we learned in third grade of optometry school, this is not your infantile congenital developmental glaucoma because the anterior segment, the anterior chamber is all normal. And this is most likely an autosomal dominant. This is actually the first, first glaucoma we genetically uh, categorized because of the strong autosomal dominant cell. Now this is a person I had seen. She was uh, she will she was cer certainly an adult, uh, but we can see this is absolute end stage disease. Now uh, at the time of at the time of diagnosis, you, you diagnose me like this, 27, 37 years old. You're uh, you're not dealing with primary open angle glaucoma. This is probably something she's had for many years. This is probably a, a case of, of uh, juvenile glaucoma. Hey, Joe, on that yeah. picture there, I'll yeah. go back. You know, they say that glaucoma does not cause optic nerve head pallor. Mm -hmm. That nerve looks very pale to me. Can you explain to uh, you know, our attendees tonight, you know, you know, they say it doesn't look pale, but that looks pretty pale to me. What's going on? Why is that, you know? Because we're looking at scleral tissue. Right. The, ner the, the neural retinal rim, which remains right here, is probably fairly perfused. And there's virtually no neural retinal rim here because we're looking at scleral tissue. We're looking at laminar tissue. That's uh, that that is not a pale nerve. That's that, that's the that's square we're looking at there. Yeah, so the so the the neuroretinal rim when it's pale is not from glaucoma. Exactly. But when the neuro the yeah you know, the neuroretinal rim remains pink and healthy in glaucoma, it just atrophies away. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now juvenile glaucoma, there is an immaturity that you're about to mesh work on a histiologic level, but it, going to scalp is normal. When you look at it, 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 is, it is open angle glaucoma in a young person. Now, the earliest that I've diagnosed this disease, true glaucoma, age eight. And a couple of years later, at age 10, I diagnosed uh, this young, young girl's brother with, with juvenile glaucoma. Here is a very important clinical pearl. I don't think it's in the notes, you may want to, you know, I mean, it's right there. Always remember, there is no normal tension juvenile open angle glaucoma. The pressure is going to be high and it's not going to be equivocal. We're not talking 19, 18, 20, which could be a problem. In all the cases that I've seen, we're talking 30s and 40s. It's not equivocal. It is high. There's no normal tension JOAG patients. So if you think it's normal tension glaucoma in a kid, it is. Uh, it's something else. It's a congenital nerve anomaly, funny looking nerve. It is not juvenile glaucoma. These always have high pressures. So Joe, if they're high, then it sounds like, you know, it sounds like an outflow issue. Trabecular mesh work is I guess we would say is compromised. You know, we do a lot of glaucoma talk, you and I, we know that primary open angle glaucoma pressure high is more of a outflow rather than an inflow. Is there anything associated with the trabecular mesh works and gonioscopy? I, I don't know the answer. You've seen more of these than I do. I'm just throwing it out there. Mm -hmm. Is there anything that we- Gonioscopically, it, it, it looks pretty well normal. 
Okay. But histologically, there, there's, there's issues that are in the angle. There's abnormal deposition of ground substance. The endothelial cells on, on Schlen's canal don't have giant vacuoles. So they can't engulf the aqueous. So there are things that are happening. And you're right, it is absolutely an outflow disease. Now, you don't always need, or you, you very rarely need, you not commonly need to lower pressure in kids. But if you do, here, here's the algorithm. Beta blockers, we tend to shy away from adults, in adults for some reason, but they are safe and pretty effective in children. Prostaglandin analogs are safe and well tolerated. The problem is they just don't work. And I don't really even consider it before puberty. It's best for children or older children with juvenile glaucoma I would say 16 to 18 is really when it really begins to, uh, to work. And I, I've tried it. I've tried it and I've, I've proven it. they just don't work. Topical carbonic anhydrase inhibitors are safe and effective. They tend to work better in kids than they do adults. Probably the best option. And bromonidine, especially under the age of eight, is unacceptable. It can cause somnolence, fatigue, and it actually induced coma in children. So bromonidine is effective, not safe. Don't consider it. Joe, CAIs you, work. Joe, are you a uh, once a day or BID when it comes to a beta blocker? BID. Okay. I'm a twice a day. And probably in, in, in virtually every child that I treat with glaucoma, it's always been there's all my temple. Oh, it works very well. So can you get away with an, uh, a generic COSOPT? Would that work well then? Absolutely. Okay. Yep. All right, 53 year old man has been treated for, for advanced glaucoma, presented with slowly progressive pain with vision loss in his right eye. He missed a few visits, one of my, one of my, uh, one of my long term patients, missed a few visits for the past year, but I was refilling his medicine through his pharmacy. His eye is now light perception. A year earlier is 2200, three years earlier is 2070, but he did have some fixation loss from the glaucoma at that time. So that leads to polling question number six. What's the most likely diagnosis? I know this one is vague. Is it advancing glaucoma and snuff out of vision, an orbital tumor, angle closure, cataract, or I don't know, that's why I'm here. I know this one is a little bit on the vaguer side. People are working through. So he has been coming back, but he has been using his medicines because he has been asking for refills. Most likely cause advancing glaucoma snuff out of vision is certainly a, a strong possibility. Tumor, angle closure, cataract. Well, and this is what he looks like. And he has his dense, hypermature, intumescent cataract. We can't see the back of his eye. You know, he had poor vision. He was really not a candidate for cataract surgeon over the course of about a year or so. He went hyper mature. This is what I call a great white. And every now and then we see a great white. Greg, when's the last time you saw a great white cataract? Oh, probably two months ago. Yeah. I saw one the last two to three weeks, and this was the, the fascinating, not sudden loss of vision, but sudden realization of loss of vision. He was a person, he was relatively young. I'm, I'm going to say he was probably in his early 50s. And uh, he said he woke up, he, has, he had been sleeping funny. And uh, one eye was sort of buried in the pillow. He said, I couldn't see my dog in the bed. And he had a great white cataract that was uh, very intermescent. And he had poor vision and just really wasn't aware of it. But we can get lens-induced glaucomas. We can get phacolytic, phacomorphic lens particle, phacoanaphylactic, and sometimes uh, misdirected lens. You know, these hypermature cataracts can cause problems. They can become phacolytic. 
phaco lens lysis, lytic lysis, the lens starts to fall apart and it creates an inflammatory reaction, which can cause a secondary, uh, secondary glaucoma. Phacomorphic, that intermescent cadre of the thickening can cause a relative pupil block and, uh, and angle closure. Now, if they ever, if a person ever has a penetrating injury, such as a dart to the eye, you can open up those nuclear proteins into the anterior chamber to say the phacolysis, and that can cause an inflammatory glaucoma. Retained lens fragments or phacoanaphylaxis, sometimes uh, a piece of nucleus, which is very bad, or a piece of cortex uh, gets left behind. Greg, I just saw a patient for a few months ago, had cataract surgery 13 years ago, was playing tennis, and had a, a sudden vision blur. A piece of lens was hiding uh, for 13 years and got knocked into position into his visual axis and created an infl inflammation. You don't see those every day. You know. Let me give a little clinical pearl for those that are listening. If you're going to send out the cataract surgery, and Joe, you, I know you're now in an ODMD practice. You know, a lot of times we as optometrists can do the best thing is, uh, is, is be a coach. And I learned to be a pretty good coach being out in Western central Pennsylvania, where, you know, I handle a lot of maybe, you know, advanced cases just because people aren't going to go to the city, as they say, um, you know, they don't want to go to Pittsburgh. They don't want to go to Harrisburg, Philadelphia, New York, Cleveland, you know, DC in my area, doc, you, you went to school, you lecture, you do this, handle this for me. And there's cases where it just needs to be surgical. And on that white lens, one of the biggest things when that lens becomes that white and cloudy is we all know that the toughest part for really cataract surgery is making that capsule erexis. And they need to be able to see as they tear around. And the, the worst thing that can happen is that capsule erexis starts to radialize, right? So, you know, cataract surgeons have you know, said, hey, Greg, it's kind of like a bag of potato chips. You know, you just kind of pop a hole in it and you want to tear that circle and bring it around and kind of end right where you started. But if you start to tear it and it starts to go around the side, that's why sometimes you'll see that happen. Then you'll see them start tearing the other way and kind of get that back to that round circle. Because once you have that round circle, it's nice and tight. You don't want that capsule to radialize long drawn out story is when they're doing a capsular rexus on that first cataract that Joe showed you, they'll, you know, it's hard to see. It starts to leak out and, it's, you know, they're trying to rinse it all out and they still can't see the capsular rexus. So they can stain it with tri pan blue. So you have surgeons, I'm not sure if there's anyone in your office, Joe, that does that. They just basically take tri pan, T-R-Y, tri pan, P-A-N, blue, stain that surface of that capsule and then when they tear, obviously it can be uh, white, but they're able just to kind of follow that and bring that right around. I do have a surgeon down in the Pittsburgh area that does like to do that. Um, you know, maybe it's a little overkill, but uh, I do send my patients to that one whenever those do come in. And that's how I can remember, Joe, that it was about two or three months ago. Because I said, please follow my lead. I got to do your follow-ups for you. Um, I want to make sure this implant, uh, you don't end up with a sutured implant or, you know, uh, iris fixed or whatever they do nowadays. If that capsule gets destroyed, uh, we always like to get that lens in the capsule. So little pearl. Yeah, great pearl, great pearl. And I think that the patient, uh, uh, the, uh, the one I just had a few, uh, few weeks ago, they used tripan blue. And I think they had a little vitreous sneak in. So they had to do a little bit of anterior vitrectomy as well. Well, this is a 25-year-old woman involved in a minor, minor automobile accident where she hit by another driver. Very minor and uh, No initial injury to either driver, both cars driven away. She felt she only like a mild to moderate bump, kind of like a bumper car, so to speak. No head trauma, no loss of consciousness. Immediately woke up the next morning. She had no pain, but she had profound double wound. Polling question number seven, what's the most likely cause? Did a subarachnoid hemorrhage and she was injured worse than she thought? A third nerve palsy, an orbital fracture, a fourth nerve palsy, a sixth nerve palsy, or, oh, I don't know, I don't know, that's why I'm here. 
which is a good answer. People thinking about this? Go back. Small out, small automobile accident, little bumper, she had a bump from behind, didn't hit anything. Very little person, no damage to the car, just drove away. Now she's got profound double vision next day. All right. So we have, we have subarachnoid hammer, she got injured, works in thought, third, fourth, sixth palsy, orbital fracture, not really sure. Okay, very good. Let's just talk about it. Double vision was vertical versus near. Distinct right hyper deviation on alternate cover test worse, worse than left gaze and right head tilt. We can see it right there. That's a signature motility of a cranial nerve for palsy. See, you now she is up. Get the Kinji images there. And she's having some profound vertical double vision. And this is common after trauma, you know, is also a very common congenital thing. We see a lot in kids, you know, the head tilt test will, will help illuminate. Here, here's the case right down here of a double fourth. You know, she's got a left fourth nerve palsy and Dolly has a right fourth nerve palsy. So this is a case of a double palsy. Anatomically, this is the most exposed of, a, of the cranial nerves. It exits the the brain, the, the midbrain posteriorly, it decussates in the anterior medullary vellum in the back of the head. It's going to go around the outside here. It is going to go around the tentorium through the cavernous sinus, the superior orbital fissure. And because of its exposed location, it's extremely uh, susceptible to trauma. It doesn't have to be a direct head trauma. It could be a jarring sort of trauma uh, there as well. Now, third nerve palsy and sixth nerve palsy are relatively protected. It takes a lot of trauma in order to cause a palsy of three or four, six. Four is very susceptible. Now, long-standing fourth nerve palsy can present with a four from decompensation. We can look at old photographs that got that compensatory head tilt. The rule of 40, 30, 20, 10, 40% 40 are traumatic, 30% are idiopathic, 20% of fourth nerve palsy are ischemic vascular, and only 10% are sinister from CNS lesions. So when you see a person like this, there's always already a 90% chance that will have a relatively good outcome. So managing fourth nerve palsies, you know, isolated, non-traumatic, you have to look for ischemic diseases. The trauma is going to be proximal and it is, it doesn't have to be very serious. It doesn't have to be like head trauma or loss of, you know, loss of consciousness, you know, shutting, jarring can, can do it. But I said, non-ischemic causes of non-traumatic isolated palsy are, are relatively uncommon. Only about 10% are, are CMS lesions. And I always look for, for evidence of long-standing decompensation. Now, these people, if, it, if it's long-standing, they've been pulling their eyes you know, together for so long, they'll have very strong vertical versions. And so always look for old photographs, looking for head tilt. Now, I threw in the term, you know, Facebook tomography, but that really isn't that great. You're, you're, these people are doing selfies and it's very artificial. You actually have to look at, at some pose pictures like uh, wedding photos or something like that or, or school photos for that compensatory head tilt. Greg, anything you want to throw in there? Oh, I'm good. All right, case eight was a resident case. The, the resident brought this case to me when I was working with him at Nova. And he got led down the primrose path of, 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 of primrose path of misdiagnosis by
by, by a previous diagnosis. This is an 84-year-old African-American man with a history of glaucoma comes in for, for consultation and care. Now, looking at the past records, he'd been diagnosed a year before with dry macular degeneration in the right eye and wet macular degeneration in the left of searchlight ring and exudates temporal to the left macula. Now, he never went for a retinal consult for the uh, for A and B. I'm going to take, ask you all to take a look or a close look at these photographs. This, you know, these up here are just the, the, the left eye. This is his right eye. I'm sure everybody's looking at it, has been looking at it. We'll go back to it again. Because my next polling question is this. My next polling is, how many things do you see wrong here? Is there one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, or I don't know. That's why I'm here. And I'll back up very much to take a look at those again. How many things are wrong? I'm, I'm going to count this myself. People take a look. Okay, I'm going to end the poll. Share the results. All right, I have three, four, five, six. Some people went up as high as seven. Okay. Okay, so we're going to go back to the poll. Okay, so let's take a look at what we see here, or at least what I, you know, I see. I, I had to count again. Okay, so. The right and left eye certainly look different. I'll tell you, one, asteroid hyalosis. Two, glaucoma. Three, there are collateral, collaterals on this disc. And what causes the collaterals? Vascular occlusions. Uh, so that's, and for three, four, we have a circinate ring of exudate there. Um, Five, we have a hemiretinal vein occlusion. Uh, six, we have drusen. Am I missing anything here, Greg? Well, uh, you said asteroid hylosis. Is there anything going on in that vitreous other than asteroid hylosis? That's it. Okay. A lot of things going on here. Does this patient have wet AMD? Next point question. This, is, should, this will be an easier one to, to opine on. You know, does this patient have what AMD? Is it yes or no? The patient was diagnosed with certainly exudation a year ago and drusen a year ago, and it looks the same. Some people are saying yes, some people are saying no, some people are saying no, no, sure. Which is a good answer. That's why we're here. People know. I think we got a good uh, representation here. Some people say yes, more say no. Some are not really sure. They want to learn and stop sharing the results. All right. Well, here are some things to consider. He is a, a person of color. Greg, how often do you see AMD in, in black patients? Uh, very rare. Exactly. And here's something to point out was by, by, the, by his old record, he had been seen to have a temporal ring of exudates, uh, temporal to the macula a year earlier. And I take a look and I, I see exactly the same thing. Wet AMD is not very, what I call stable, is it Greg? I mean, I, I would expect at this point to, be, to see some fibrotic scar. Like a, like a discoform scar by this point, mm -hmm. kind of. Yeah, I agree. And of course, it doesn't make any easier. Asteroid hyalosis, you know, it, it's pretty to look at, but when, you know, it, it does get in your way. 
But as we take a look here, what I want to point out is within the circular area of exudate is this round, small lesion, maybe not so small, and that is actually more consistent with a retinal arterial macrogen. So heavy retinal occlusion, glaucoma, retinal bruising, aspirated hyalosis, disc collateral telling us he probably had a vascular occlusion in his fellow eye as well, and a circular ring of exudate. Remember, even though it's been diagnosed elsewhere by somebody else, doesn't mean it's the right diagnosis. Very unusual in a person of of African descent, that unchanging appearance may be very suspicious, and we can certainly see that sacral dilatation, which was a retinal macro aneurysm. Greg, do you have any, any pearls on macro aneurysms? Um, no. Uh, I mean, blood pressure related, uh, get them to a retinologist. They can uh, follow them, put a little laser retina uh, barrier around them. Um, blood pressure related. Uh, there's tons of vascular stuff going on in this eye that there's this patient more than probably just uh, high blood pressure going on. I mean, they have a hemiretinal vein occlusion. They have a macro aneurysm. Um, there's a lot of vascular, vascular pathies going on in this eye. Indeed there are. And here's a clinical pearl. There's two clinical pearls. And I know you and I have talked about this before. One of the things that can cause multi-layer hemorrhages is macro aneurysm. I've seen them cause hemorrhages anywhere from subretinal to vitreous. Also, when you see an area of circinate retinopathy and an absence of other retinopathy that would be suggestive of diabetes, look carefully in that central area looking for that sacular dilatation and maybe subtle. And that's why you're OCT may be very helpful. Well, here's a case, a 46 year old woman who has a history of breast cancer five years earlier and was using tamoxifen at the time. She reported she got some cleaning fluid in her right eye four weeks earlier. She had some moderate pain and a little bit of visual blur which subsided, but then several hours later her vision significantly diminished. She attributed this to getting the chemical in the eye, even though her vision got better than got worse. She is now 2400 in the right eye. She clears it was 2020 by our records. She's got a relative apparent defect in the right eye. She's a pale optic disc and attenuated retinal arterioles. And the OCT shows profound thinning uh, on, her, on her OCT. Now here is a clinical pearl I want to point out is this all began four weeks early. Based upon things that we've done and we've taught Greg, how long do we have to figure this out? Well, Joe, I was on the mental pina colada as I was trying That's to help right. a patient, but I see four weeks earlier. So four weeks, we have to figure it out. Yep, how long we spend there is how long we have to figure it out. So, with our polling question here, what is the likely diagnosis for this patient? Is it arteritic anterior ischemic optic neuropathy? Is it non arteritic ischemic neuropathy? Is it a central retinal artery occlusion? Is it a chemical injury to the optic nerve? Is it a tumor? Is it optic neuritis? Or I don't know, that's why I'm here to learn. Joe, can you go back so I can look at it real quick? I was helping sure. one of our attendees. I just want to kind of see the case. 46 year old, breast cancer, tamoxifen, 2400. Okay, thank you. Pale nerve, large cup, ready arterioles, thin retina. A lot of potentials here. Okay, people are thinking about this one. This is a little more challenging. They're working at it. Shall we call it here, Greg? Yep, okay. I did. I did. Yep. All right, so likely diagnosis the edge, edging out is central retinal artery occlusion. So as we take a look 
you know, is it Ari Riddick at age 46? Not likely. Anything under the age of 50 is reportable. It's going to make you famous, but likely infamous because we wouldn't think about giant arthritis and patient body go up and become bilaterally blind. That's why I called him Dick Rowe famous the wrong way. Non arteritic ischemic neuropathy. Well, she does have a very large cup, and that wasn't a disc at risk. Central retinal artery occlusion certainly is in the uh, differential chemical injury to the optic nerve. I can't give you a plausible explanation that, and uh, that's what she had in artery occlusion. So based upon the, the sudden painless loss of vision, pale nerve, attenuated vessels, profound thinning, clearly it is most likely a central retinal artery occlusion. The chemical exposure really had no, uh, no bearing. Now causes of CRA. Heart disease, cardiovascular disease, GCA in older people, smoking, obesity, carotid artery disease, bacterial endocarditis, you know, emboli are coming from somewhere. The calcific emboli from the heart are more likely to cause retinal artery occlusion than uh, the cholesterol emboli from the carotid arteries. You know, there are also are other etiologies due to uh, clotting factors, such as antiphospholipid disease, factor, factor eight, uh, abnormalities, protein S and C alterations. These are all thrombotic diseases we have to consider. But in a 46 year old person, you know, giant cell atherosclerosis, hypertension, diabetes, not likely. Now, tamoxifen is an estrogen, uh, selective estrogen receptor. It has been noted to co be cause crystalline retinopathy, but she didn't have crystal, you know, any crystalline maculopathy, and that would be bilateral. So a direct cause is not likely, but tamoxifen is associated with thrombotic events. CRA can be caused by thrombophilia, particularly homocystinemia. Uh, this can be caused by exogenous estrogens, such as oral contraceptives, and tamoxifen, so breast cancer can also create a prothrombotic state. So the most likely cause that we came up with based upon ruling out other factors was this was a tamoxifen associated thrombophilia leading to a central artery occlusion. Now, because this was over a month old, referral to a stroke unit was really not required. It was not necessarily embolic. So we had a discussion about the association with tamoxifen use and prevention uh, of future thrombotic events. Greg, any, any comments on this, to this topic? Yeah, I, I want to kind of give another clinical pearl here. You mentioned it a slide back that, you know, that I think you said calcium uh, create the uh, cal calcific, calcium creates the embolic uh, in a central retinal artery occlusion as opposed to the, to the to calcium, I'm sorry, to cholesterol. And I just want, if people can see my, my sticky pad here, um, I just kind of like want to point that out because, you know, why is that? The, the reason being is if you think about the shape of the emboli, right? Calcium balls are usually what build up on the heart valves and they release in their ball-like shape. So when it gets to the point where it can't go any further, it's clogged up, no blood can get in. And calcium, as we all know from Lime Away commercials, doesn't really dissolve real easy. So you're gonna have a pretty good clog in that artery and it's gonna be lasting a while and you're not gonna get much blood flow. If you think about cholesterol plaques on the carotid arteries, they, they build up in sheets. And what happens is it breaks off. And then as it goes past the central retinal artery because of the morphology of it and gets into the, into the branch retinal artery. And there's times when we take those Optimap images that we were talking about and you see that Holland horse plaque, patient's totally asymptomatic. And the reason being and why I got this sticky pad out is because the reason why you're seeing it is not because this is the ar artery that it's lodged in, it's lodged that way, or it's lodged this way in a sense. And the artery is going around 
this way. So now you can see the plaque, but you can see the blood can flow above and below. Patients totally asymptomatic that's out there. When someone has a central or a branch retinal artery occlusion, you see the cotton wool spot and the retinal edema that occurs beyond it. Usually you don't see the plaque because if this is the artery as I was trying to show you before and it's lodged this way, it can flow above and beyond, it lodges this way. And as you're looking down on that blood vessel cause it's so thin, it's lodged in here, you can't see it. So that's why when you see a branch retinal artery occlusion from cholesterol, you usually don't see the plaque because it's too thin to be able to see it this way. And it creates the artery branch retinal artery occlusion. If it's this way and it's in the vessel where the blood can flow above and beyond, the patient is asymptomatic, but it all goes back to long drawn out when Joe said that to me to think it's all based on the morphology of the embolic material, flat versus calcium. The other embolic material would be a thrombus. Kind of excellent, stringy. excellent, uh, excellent uh, information, Craig. Let's wrap it up with a 78 year old female who has a sudden onset of ptosis in her uh, left eye in the upper, uh, upper right hand corner. She noticed that immediately following parathyroid surgery to remove three parathyroid adenomas. She, uh, her, her son taking her home from surgery noticed her eyelid drooping immediately after surgery and just thought it was an issue with uh, the anesthesia. And she also has a small, it's hard to see, but she has a smaller pupil there as well. So next morning she wakes up and she has a toaster. She calls her surgeon, sends her to the emergency room, thinks she's having a stroke. She has a non-contrast enhanced CT scan of the brain. Why? Because it's what they know to do. And she's not having a hem hemorrhage, intracranial hemorrhage, so she is released. She comes to see me late uh, afternoon on a Friday. She tells me the whole story. She's got headache and eye pain. Uh, there's a dilation lag and a problem with iapidine test on this woman. And she clearly has orders. Now, what is the most likely cause of this corner syndrome that she has? So this, I think, our last polling question. Is it lung cancer? Is it carotid dissection? Is it direct surgical trauma to the nerve? Is it migraine or who oh, knows why I'm here? Okay, people are, are rapidly responding on this one, Greg. Yeah, good, uh, good action. Mm -hmm. I'll give it about five more seconds. Everyone get their answer in five second warning. And we'll end the poll now. Excellent. And most people say direct uh, surgical trauma to the nerve. And I, I'm going to tell you that really is a plausible diagnosis and the diagnose or, or the etiology that I would like to embrace, but there's something that's bothering me about here is the headache and the eye pain. Now, she's actually rather fatigued. She's emotional. Um, she's not feeling well. She just had surgery the day before. She's not fully recovered, but this goes together, get like cookies and cream. You, you, have, you have neck surgery, you have Horner syndrome. Happens immediately after, makes all the sense in the world. But I don't like the headache and the eye pain. And Greg, you know, you and I have talked about this. We've taught this uh, in many a seminar. Sudden onset corners with headache and eye pain. You know, neck surgery is not going to give me that. And what I have to worry about is something called carotid dissection. And you know, we're we're in we're in one of my our branch offices at a large medical surgical facility. And I explained to her how uncomfortable I am with this whole idea of a diet, you know, of just saying this is what it is, even though there's a 90% likelihood this is direct surgical trauma. I don't like the head pain, the eye pain. 
So I want to send her to the ER if she doesn't want to go. She refuses to go. She said, I just had a brain scan. So you didn't get the right brain scan. And I think she dropped the bomb on me. I think she said, you know, you're an optometrist. And she may have actually used the term only optometrist. She goes, what, what about the ophthalmologist? Can I see one of the ophthalmologists? I said, there's nobody here. I'm going to do the same thing I'm going to do. She said, well, what about a neuro-ophthalmologist? Because she's a retired nurse. So she knew, she, she knows medicine. So can I see it? Can I see a neuro ophthalmologist? Said, well, you're welcome to do that. There's, there's nothing wrong. So can I do that now? I said, no, why? It's 4.40 on a Friday. I'm the best you're going to get. So we go back and forth. She won't uh, listen to my, my worrying about a possible carotid dissection, but she did acquiesce to taking aspirin. I asked her if, you, if she would take aspirin, she would. So I put her on aspirin. Called the next day. She felt much better. Her eye hurt less. Her head hurt less, but she still had it. Uh, I didn't like the, uh, the sound of this. So after nagging her for a while, I, when she starts to feel better after recovering from surgery, I get her in, I do, a, I do get an image and she actually had a carotid dissection. Now, what is carotid dissection? That is a third order of Horner's uh, cause where there is eye pain, head pain, neck pain, it's acute onset, any painful new onset corners has to be considered to be carotid dissection. This is a linear tear in the vessel wall, and it leads to a thrombus. And thrombus, as you said, Greg, can lead to embolus. And embolus can lead to stroke. And this is why this is actually an emergency situation. Of these people who end up with a, 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 a hemispheric stroke, 52% of patients with carotid dissection are going to have a hemispheric stroke within six days. Two thirds within the first week, 90% within two weeks, after 31 days, there's no more risk. The vessel wall has repaired itself. They don't need neurosurgery, they don't need vascular surgery, but they need stroke prevention. That's why these patients should go right to the emergency room telling them what to look for now. How do we find, it's actually a relatively small dissection. How do we find it? We told them what to look for, specifically what to look for, and they found it. And we worked with the, with the radiologist. That works out very well. We tell them what to look for and help them find it. If it's there, they tend to find it. If they're going in blind, they don't. So I'm very, I'm very happy that I, 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 I listened to my inner voice on this one. I'm very glad I put her on aspirin. So I think this all prevented her from having a, a, a hemispheric stroke. She's doing very well. She's gone back up more. She invited me to come up to go to a Bills game with her. Greg, any comments? No, any I think the any wrap -ups? I think the reason why you were able to solve it because she said that you were only an optometrist. I think the the lower swing is you're just an optometrist. So. Yes. <laughs> I'm not sure what word she exactly used, but something happened there and I did not take offense to it. Because she turned out to be a really nice person. Anything else, Greg? Any, any questions in the chat room? Yeah, the chat has been quiet tonight. I launched the polling question a while ago and uh, that's it. Nothing's out there. So. Well, I guess the only thing I want to wrap up is, is, is a term I had used a couple times before and I didn't, I didn't I didn't allude to it. I talked about getting famous the wrong way or getting Dick Rowe famous. I don't know if I've ever told you this story, but uh, Dick Rowe is, is very famous as a music producer because he's the guy who turned down the Beatles. He said the Beatles would never amount to anything and the guitar bands were, uh, were on their way out. So he turned them down. He became very famous in the wrong way for turning down the Beatles. Now, he did get a chance to redeem himself. Uh, about two years after this fatal mistake, he found himself judging a talent contest in Britain, sitting next to one George Harrison. He felt very uncomfortable because you know he told them they were not going to amount to anything. And George was a nice lad of 23. He said you know, he was very nice to him. They got along very well and he felt more comfortable. So he asked George, he said, is anybody in this talent show any good? And George said, no, but there's this lot of guys down at the Crawdaddy Club called the Rolling Stones that we think are really pretty good. 
And without another word, Dick Rowe got up, went down, caught the Rolling Stones at the club and signed into a contract saying it was never going to happen a second time. So if you ever find yourself getting Dick Rowe famous the wrong way, at least hope you have a chance to redeem yourself. So with that, thank you for attending tonight. Greg, why don't you bring this one home for us? Yep. Thanks, everyone, for attending uh, Clinical uh, Case Challenges. It's been a pleasure here to, uh, to present this with uh, Joe and myself. And we have Vanessa here as our uh, conference administrator. So thank you for attending. I have a little bit of housekeeping to do now.